you know, a lot of people have asked me, do you ever give lessons? And I said, no, I don't. I'm a self-taught artist. I really learned everything about delivery um, on my own, making my own mistakes. And of course, um, a lot of very good instruction from Kent Ulberg, uh, which is the subject of your being here, of course. Well, Matthew, then do you want to do the official? Um, yeah, let's do it. Uh, and, I, and I also wanted to say I meant to talk. We're in your gallery right now, yeah, and it's still open, so we still have we still have the occasional uh, person stopping in and looking around. It so shouldn't be maybe. too bad, yeah. No. But if we hear anything, it's okay. We'll, yeah, we'll we'll, uh, we'll yeah. roll with it. Yeah. But yeah, why don't you give us uh, give us? So the we'll do the we'll do the intro for it, and then okay. that way, when you can, when it's time, you can snip everything together, right, Matthew? That's right. All right. Okay, so welcome everybody to Creative Moonlighting. Um, today we have the immense pleasure of welcoming a true legend in the field, a man whose tireless efforts have not only brought us closer to understanding our oceans, but have also inspired millions worldwide to protect and preserve our underwater ecosystems. So please join us as we extend a warm aquatic welcome to none other than Guy Harvey, renowned marine biologist, award-winning artist, conservationist extraordinaire, and an advocate for sustainable fishing practices. Guy's unwavering passion for marine life has propelled him to become one of the most influential figures in ocean research and conservation. Um, you have over four decades of experience studying various species in their natural habitats, and really we're so honored because we know that your expertise is unparalleled. Um, his groundbreaking work on shark behavior, specifically pioneering research on great white sharks and many others, has revolution revolutionized our understanding of these magnificent creatures. Moreover, his captivating artwork has served as a powerful medium to raise awareness about the fragile beauty that lies beneath the waves. And throughout his illustrious career, Guy Harvey has collaborated with leading scientists on groundbreaking expeditions across the globe. Through his organization, the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation, he actively supports research initiatives aimed at preserving delicate ecosystems and promoting sustainable fishing practices. So today we are so excited to have the opportunity to talk with you about marine conservation challenges, the importance of education and fostering environmental stewardship. Also, collaboration. The reason why we're here today is because of Kent Olberg, who uh, is a dear friend of our family and a dear friend of yours. And so without further ado, let's uh, dive into this conversation. Thank you very much, Denise and Matt. Great. Nice to, uh, nice to have you over here and uh, looking forward to the next couple of days of productivity. Oh my goodness, me me too. Uh, you know, and just a little background is is that uh, we are making a documentary about Kent, and that's how we got connected uh, through Kent and Virla to you. And you were so gracious to say, "Yeah, sure, come on, we'll 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 take we'll do the interview. We can do a podcast." And this is kind of a good way for us to warm up to be able to, first of all, learn more about your story, and then also connect the dots with that and 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 with Kent. Kent definitely was um, um, a mentor. Because he was like, um, you you got to have more variety. Don't be so hard. You, your anatomy is excellent, but there's different ways of doing art and feel unconstrained um, in in taking on different media. And so he really brought me out of a very tight pen and ink sketches, very highly detailed. Every scale is done, every fin ray to be looser and add more color and experiment and make mistakes and find out what works for you. Because of all things, as an artist, uh, when you're when you're actually painting to make money, you don't want to waste time. You want to be on the money in terms of literally delivering a finished product that you can sell. Part of the drive that I have is is not to waste time when you when you're down drawing and sketching and painting or whatever. I make every stroke count. So does that ever get in the way of the experimentation part? Not really. Uh, not nowadays, certainly, because that's a great question, because I do sketches to start with, and I keep them all nowadays, um, part of the sort of art library I'm, I've been meticulous about, because they do become a painting later on in life. <laughs> right now, well, we just came back from Guatemala two weeks ago, and I'm very inspired by <clears throat> interactions with spinner dolphins, the eastern tropical uh, Pacific spinner dolphin, and there's about four different subspecies of spinner dolphin around the world, but this one is 
peculiar and particular because it's it's very monochromatic, very dark, almost the color of this book. So I said, this is going to demand a big canvas because there's so many animals and they're, of course, interacting with tunas, yellowfin tunas, and there's sailfish there too, which we are fishing for. And it's like, this has to be a big canvas. So I, I started two weeks ago on a big one, 15 feet by six feet. So that's pretty big. Pretty, this is only four by eight. It's not, it's not as big as what I saw in the airport. Yeah. But oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that, 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 what is that one, by the way, the airport one? Is I saw that today, too. Um, is, it, is it 90? 90? I thought I read it was 90 feet I mean, tall. Tall, yes, it is 90 feet, yeah. By, I think, 35 or something. Okay. We we built a house, a new house in Cayman, eight year, nine years ago, plus a big studio. Uh, it's like two and a half thousand square feet. And a lot of all my reproductions and magazine covers and stuff are adorn the walls, the, the successful prints. I have a ton of Ken's work in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jillian is not that much into fish. <laughs> oh my gosh. So all things. <laughs> I'm being honest. <laughs> <laughs> the, and the so we, we have very few, if any, fish pieces in the house. I love working in my studio, my personal studio. I worked in the gallery in Cayman often when we when we opened it. It's been open for 18 years. Um, Kent always said it takes two years for a gallery to become established. And he's right. And so, you know, don't overexpect too much. And so I went to work there every single day to help boost business and have walk-ins and chit-chat and sign stuff and build a clientele, and it really did work. He and Viela were very instrumental in getting me nominated to become a member of the SAA. And, um, you know, since then, I've, I've always maintained my membership. It's a very prestigious organization of which to be a member. And um, he's been very influential in the SAA for, I don't know, four generations, ah, four decades. So, yeah. Um, and on another administrative note, <laughs> um, Denise, my, my daughter, when she became the CEO of the foundation, she changed the name immediately. Oh. It's now the Guy Harvey Foundation. Okay. Guy so, Harvey Foundation. Yeah, it's less words. <laughs> it's <a> simpler. <laughs> anyway, the, um, we can get on to um, you know, the other things. But yeah, so so we'll... I'll I'll drop in and mention Ken from time to time because he's you know he's been a big part of my life all these years, <clears throat> and um, we've helped each other. You know, there's no doubt about that. But I think uh, because I've collected his work as well, um, and never been a sculptor, ever tried to do sculpture, uh, it's because he's he is so good at it. And I'm not talking about just you know the smaller pieces that he's done, which are available to the public. Uh, in limited editions, but his monumental pieces are his his signature pieces, and um, I'll tell you a funny joke about that later. But um, you know, he he is the best wildlife sculptor in the world. He's a physicist, a chemist, um, a construction guy, um, an architect, all in one. Yeah, he's astounding. I, yeah, that is outrageous. One thing that stood out to me when I first started uh, reading a bit about your story was that um, you were highly impacted by uh, Ernest Hemingway and by the old man in the sea. Hemingway. Ha-ha. Hemingway. And that was we, a big thing for Kent too. Hemingway. It, it, it really was. For everybody, I think, in our genre. Um, it's funny, I, I opened this, did a book signing of my latest book um, down in Key West at the Papa's Pilar rum making facility down there <laughs> um and they they now work very closely with the hemingway family in fact they have the licensee to the license rather to to make the hemingway rum so there's another connection right yeah so hemingway uh, and this rum. is the new book yeah. the Ten Thousand chicken sandwiches yeah yeah we'll get into that in yeah. a bit. but so our connection with hemingway and the story of course goes back a long way and it it starts in jamaica growing up as a as a kid fishing with with people who caught big fish from small boats um, on hand lines. And uh, it was an, it is still an astounding feat. A lot of people still do it. But so I was familiar with that. I'd watched people um, fight big fish from small boats because I used to go out fishing with them. And so when my mother gave me the book to read, uh, the, the version she gave me didn't have any illustrations. 
So I was like, here's an opportunity. And then I found out a couple of years later to my annoyance that a couple of other artists had actually done it before. Uh -huh. I wondered about uh -huh. that because that that was your first big exhibition, wasn't it? Well, much later, Matt. It, it, I did that when I was uh, 17, 18. Um, so 1974, 75. Um, and into my 20th year, it carried over a bit. Um, and I didn't do anything with the project. I sat on it for at least 10 years. So it just sat in a shelf somewhere in a big portfolio. And it, I, I did touch it up a little bit because some of them had been done in blue ballpoint pen, which is not, A, it doesn't last very long. Uh -huh. And B, um, it, it's not a recognized art form like pen and ink. Although it's the same material, and I still have them, I, I kept them all. But was it the, easier to draw with? It it or was faster, was it just, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, and of course, ink can be very messy, if, especially if you're not in control. Uh, yeah, and if you're, are you right-handed or left-handed? Right. You're okay. right-handed. Okay. <laughs> so, the 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 story remained quiet until 1985, when Gillian, who we were dating then, we started dating in '84. Um. She said, you can get all this art together. I'll help you organize it. I'll find a gallery, and I'll find somebody to see if we can make reproductions, which we did. And we found everything there in Jamaica. We went to a very established gallery called Upstairs Downstairs in downtown Kingston, the old part of Kingston. And we printed, there was there was 60 images, and we printed 12 in a uh, hundred sets of 12 prints. And they were quite large, black and white. And I signed a number of them all. And we sold them for the equivalent of $220 US for a set. Wow. It was it was um, 1,200 Jamaican dollars then. And then I gave a copy. Well, a friend of mine who's, who was a photojournalist at the tournaments we fished said, Give me a copy. I'll give it to the IGFA, International Game Fish Association, whose office used to be further down the street. And we'll put it in their auction. And that year, 1986, it sold for like $5,000 <laughs> US. And my eyes were opened. It was like, well, holy cow. So the went to the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show and had them for sale at, at I think it was 1200 US dollars for the set. Not twelve hundred Jamaican. Yeah, too oh, bad yep. we couldn't and, have gotten our hands on that we, one. We sold them all, and the, that entire edition has has sold out. And so I did. People said it's a lot of space, you know, to go up on a wall takes up a lot of space. Can you do a set of eight? And said, so we did. We did a, another set of eight, smaller size, which we still have a few floating around. Um, and that was an edition of two hundred, and we we sold them pretty steadily all the way. So it really was the first, my first venture, and you can cut this down to make it shorter, but it was my first venture into, I'm I'm not going to use the word derogatively, but it was commercial art. It was your painting to sell art. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's um, it certainly got me going. And the, the boat shows, I'm meeting Kent, which came a year later, by the way, okay. 1987. Y'all met at a boat show. Yeah, at the at the Miami boat show okay. in, in February, um, 1987. Okay. And uh, we I, we wondered no. that. I it was one thing I hadn't had the chance to ask yeah. Kent yet, but I knew he had the big sailfish uh, here. The the uh, it was going in, and okay. and he was he'd come to help uh, with the idea for the installation or we'll get mm -hmm. it installed which is part, the front part of his book, which is just fascinating, Yeah, the whole story behind it. But it was the biggest wildlife um, Monument in the world. sculpture in the world at the time. I don't know if there's been, he's done a bigger one since or somebody else, but it was very much 3D and it took up a huge um, footprint and all that with many different animals. Yep. It. Spectacular. All around, yep. right? All around the yep. sides, he had different. And my friend, uh, my friend, um, Kay Pearson, who owned the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show and show management and all these production companies here, uh, also collected Kent's work. I was a huge supporter of our both of our work, bought a lot of art from us, and he organized the unveiling of the statue of Kent's uh, way back in, because the city hadn't had a formal unveiling back in nine, about 1990, I'm going to say. Yeah. So, very cool.
Yeah, that is, oh. I mean, that is incredible. Just the, mm. and the crossover, because, it, you know, I always think about artists. If you're doing it long enough, you're going to find other people that you obviously respect just as much. And, and, and it's like you, you yeah. sort of grow together, you know? And, and the introduction to the Society of Animal Artists and, and the other artists there was a, a huge, had a huge effect on me to, to meet other people so accomplished with their own specialities. Mm-hmm. Nobody really painted fish that much, to be honest with you. Aquatic art was minimal. Um, but to meet some of the other big names um, was, and they're just normal people like you and me, and but they have amazing talent. And it was just like it rubs off on you. Yeah. And was aquatic yeah. art limited because artists weren't divers? You know, they, they hadn't had the opportunity to see it the way you get to see it? That, that's a very good point. Um, and even to this day, I think if if you look at the number of artists in the SAA, I think there's about 300. And in the Artists for Conservation, which is a Canadian-based organization with whom I'm a member as well, um, they have about 500 members. And some artists are in both, some are not. Um, it's, out, it's out of their choosing. Um, but you can probably count the artists who, who paint aquatic scenes, and I'm, I'm including fresh water. I'm not including birds landing on water. Yeah. Um, on one hand. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you 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 loved it as a kid, so it's yeah. not like you saw, uh, hey, this is an opening because, I mean, but you just happened to be in a small group of people. Right. Very small group. Um, and... There are a couple of people who've done well with it on the more commercial aspect, and and Wyland certainly has been well out in the forefront on this. He and I work very closely together on many different projects. We've done, I think, nine collaborations together, and he does that with other artists too. And I've worked on some of his his big formats, like the, the public murals that he does, kind of the equivalent to Kent's big monumental mm-hmm. sculpture, but in a painting sense. Um, and it's it's a very big marketing tool for him too. Okay. So there's there's two different ways of approaching this. You know, I I got into licensing in a big way, which many of the artists, the SAA members shun. I, I they, wanted they to will, talk to you about that. They will yeah. sell you know fine art products and and books and stuff like that, but they won't go into licensing apparel or whatever. But that has been one of the the key features of 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 this brand, um, is the availability of art on different materials to people. Um, and you don't have to, you know, buy a frame and <laughs> hang it on your wall. And well, even when I was... buy any more because you run out of space, a T-shirt is a disposable item. But, you know, while you've got it, um, it's nice to have. Mm. Nice I have to give to other people and it's inexpensive. And I mean, I had, as a kid, uh, um, I had a number of shirts. Yeah. And, and I, I'll, I'll be honest, I think I might have recognized your signature first because it was on the pocket. And I, of course, knew that on the back, but I was too young to understand, oh, the person whose signature is on the front, that painting is the person who painted that. <laughs> it, was, it was too young to figure that out until later. But well, And somebody actually painted that. that. Someone painted yeah. that. Yeah. Right. Well, you bring up another good point, which is um, when did you come up with your signature is a question. That is, yeah. I would love to know that. Yes. So, so when you go back and look at some of those old 1973, 74, 75 drawings, the pen and inks, which are in this book here, some of the signatures are the old style guy, Harvey, mm. with the, with the long tails, but not as long as they are now. So it, it only it only changed a little bit in that time, simply because um, it was it just evolved. Yeah, but it's it's always been like that. And in in the gallery in Cayman, I have a one of my favorite paintings of a Jamaican woman carrying a bunch of bananas on her head with two donkeys and straw hampers carrying produce to the market as very detailed pen and ink um, and the signature is there and it's just like the, the it's guy, not the it's not the the focal or it's right. not as prominent as it is now right yeah and and the person Rolly working who um, first licensed my art at t-shirts for Florida just up the road here in um, on Oakland Park it's about four X's up on I-95 um, said I'm gonna he was very 
authoritative. He knew exactly what he wanted to do, which is fair. Dear Ali, he's dead now, but he, he, he really was another mentor to me in many respects and a great fishing guy. He, he had many world records, introduced me to Tropic Star, things like that. Um, very influential. But he said, I love this signature. I'm going to put it on the pocket. Everybody's going to love it. And he was absolutely he right. He was right. Yeah. And every time somebody's tried to change it, you know, guy, I was out in the world, guy, I was this, no. and add some other Something. entanglement to it. It was just like, it never worked. And the two dots, there's two dots. Uh-huh. Is that a... Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about those. Well, I have to be honest. <laughs> in those days, um, when I, whenever I sent, signed my name, I would, you know, do a, a full stop afterward, but my hand would bounce, and so you get a, you get a double hit. So you, what you were, that was not on purpose, not on purpose, but it, it just became that way. And in the end, I got asked so many times by people. This is after I had kids. I said this for my kids, and they go, "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, Matt. I let that thing. <laughs> Why not? It, you know, it's just complicated explaining yeah. how you write. They, they go, oh, you have such nice handwriting. Well, guess what? At school in England, we were taught that handwriting is absolutely good handwriting, is essential to you becoming a good human being, which is true. Yeah, handwriting <laughs> was such a big thing. Even when we were kids, yeah. yeah. And, of course, nowadays that, that's lost. But so nowadays I just say back to the signature, is is for my two kids, and now I'm going to have to add the grandkids. Oh, uh, uh, oh! So yeah. you have two dots for each kid, but now you got to add. How many dots are you going to have to have? No, I'm just pulling your leg. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Can't go add enough people. Well, I was like, whoa, you're going to have a lot of we dots. We do. We have we have two two little girls. So uh, okay. Harper, two Harper and Corey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, so uh, on the, I want to talk about that the licensing piece because yeah. obviously that was huge. Well, how did that, how how was that idea spawned? Licensing. Well, we started out, of course, with art. So we made yeah. productions, which is a type type of licensing, but you're in, you're in control. Mm. And I, we are still in control. I'd never given that out. Um, the, the use of the art library, which is meticulously documented, um, is, is very much controlled. And we make it available nowadays to licensees through a, a digital library to which they're given a formula, they have access, and they can use it. A company that's authorized can use it for whatever they want. Um, but they have to have uh, everything approved by us. When I say us, it can be me, it can be my son, it can be Jessica, it can be somebody with authority. Um, so the the DL, I call it, the digital library, is, is our, our greatest value, our greatest asset. Um, it's probably over 3,000 pieces of art now. Wow. Um, and so it's it's a tremendous catalog of everything I've done. And occasionally I still find people who bought paintings from me from 1982 or 83, and they've escaped, so to speak. Mm. So I get a picture of them and I send them to Michelle, who's over there, and she's in charge of the library, and um, say, hey, I find this. And now and can now you know where it is. is. Yeah, okay. it's logged in. Uh, and that, that's a, we send them a certificate of authenticity. And um, um, it's just you know if if they want to have it valued for insurance or I see yeah well so and kind of what I w- was curious about was w- at what point in your career did did it dawn on you to maybe because like you said some people shun that some artists shun that what what point did it dawn on you to maybe do that um the brand became very popular very quickly let's put it like that. Uh, there was nobody in that space in the in the late eighties, early nineties, and when we transitioned from T-shirts of Florida to Afco, which is a California-based uh, company, um, it became even more popular because they did a better job, <clears throat> not only of the the quality of the manufacturing and printing, but also the distribution, which is far more important than having a good product. By the way, and so many people, you know, have had good products and they just haven't been able to get it out in front of the consumer in in a sufficient way, so they they don't make money. Um, so it, it's it's just grown not exponentially, but it grew and grew and grew. Um, and the brand, you know, spread and people travel a lot, so they buy gifts for people and 
you know, especially here in America. I mean, Casey, how many people do you get from Iowa and Minneapolis and Cleveland? All right. Oh, wow. Not really. Guy Harvey is and what he's about, and when they come in, they to look at it all and learn a little bit about who he is. Yeah, and so you know right. you're making you're making fans left, right, and center. Was it always um, from the onset you wanted to use the apparel as a way to fund research, or how did when did that evolve? That and and it it took a decade okay. for us to okay. make enough money that we had enough to shave off and put it back into um, some kind of give back. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Mm -hmm. in determining that, um, my business manager at the time, Charlie Foreman's family, he's from Fort Lauderdale, his family were were very uh, invested in Nova Southeastern University. Okay. And his father, actually, Dr. Charles Foreman, was a big sponsor of the Oceanographic Center at the time, which is now completely transformed into a huge building and monumental compared to what it was then. But that that's how that evolves because I'd given up academia yes. in 1987. When I, you started I resigned, art yeah. full-time. Yep. How has that been? But I, I'm curious about this transition from academia to art. Do you feel like it, like, were they directly connected? Do you feel like it helped you be a better artist? Do you feel like it helps you make more of an impact? Like, the the transition was out of necessity. Um, the the grant for my PhD program expired in nineteen eighty two, I think it was. It was a grant from the British government, um, and I was still finishing up my doctorate. My dad was dying from cancer. There was a lot of family trouble. You know, he was going to take over the farm and all that stuff, and it was it was kind of traumatic. So I left it for a bit and. Um, started to supplement mm-hmm. my income by selling art, mm-hmm. and it was mostly on commissions. People said, "Hey, I love your your birds and flowers, especially." Denise were were desirable, and um, I still do them to this day. I think there are a couple ones, a couple over here, um, and the ladies especially would commission them. So it was mm-hmm. it was tough being a PhD student and getting very little pay, and so all of a sudden. You know, you you got, hey, I want three pieces. I want, you know, this hummingbird, that hummingbird, and, a, you know, a, a dove or something. And so off we went. Did you find that it you felt happier too? You know, did it, did it change That's your... That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was, I, I enjoyed the science. I enjoyed the research work. I love teaching students, um, doing field trips. I started a whole diving course at university in Jamaica. And we had all our third year marine science kids as qualified BSAC divers by the end of the time I left, which is very gratifying. It, it allowed them to get into the marine environment without fear and just go and see what they were studying. Um, and, and to get away from academia was, uh, well, I had to finish my PhD. That was the sort of stranglehold on, on my time. And it was very, very time consuming. Uh, But I got it done, graduated, um, spent another year and a half at university. And then that's when, by 1987, I said, I have to hand hand over. This is developing into something big. You had to make a decision. I think that was a big thing for us, even with uh, Griffin Co. Productions, which is the production company. I think that is also just a, a big decision that artists have to make at, at what point is it realistic for you to make your living off of what you love to do and what you're good at. Exactly. And to that point, I would be teaching when I had the lecture schedule sorted out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, jumping on an Air Jamaica plane to Miami on the Wednesday evening, or working up here Thursday, Friday, Saturday get back Sunday, and I, I did that for a long time, and it was too much. Yeah. And Scott Boyd, who is a local icon up here, um, just on Andrews Avenue, his which is three blocks down the road here, um, his shop was just down on 508, and I was based out of there, and very kindly, and um, he's dead now, but um, he was the guy who, who really found me, so to speak, and Raleigh working from T-shirts to Florida, 
was one of his customers. And Raleigh, being a av- very avid and accomplished light tackle angler, uh, said, Scott went to Raleigh and said, hey, this guy can paint. And you're looking for an artist to do fish art on? This is your guy. And oh, so wow. that, that was the connection. So that's hu- I mean, that's yeah. a huge moment. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, Scott was became very influential in um, developing the business, developing the brand. Um, he knew everybody through the fishing business because of his, you know, he's a tackle guy. Everybody came to buy stuff from him. And when they went on the campaign to the Bahamas or St. Thomas or Venezuela or Mexico or wherever they're fishing, they'd run out of stuff or something would break and he'd, he'd get it to them. And it was just like he knew everybody. Hmm. And so that's that's that was a great connection to have. And, but those uh, those were, I mean, it sounds like there were several of those key moments where you were really getting your art in front of a lot of people. Because, a lot of people. Yeah. And every appearance I do, kids come up, you know, uh, young people come up to me, you know, how do you do what you do? So I, I tell them, but more, the other people who really want to make a go of it and, and make it, a career out of it, ask, how do you do what you do? And it's, there's no easy answer to that because in our time was different. We had to go and get in front of people, schlep your stuff to all these shows, physically be there. There was no website. There was no social media. There was no way of electronically blasting yourself out there at very little cost. You literally had to go and sweat blood and tears. And of course, there were failures and disappointments and bad shows and good shows. And... um. It was a different life. Uh, Ken would have gone through all of that too. <laughs> um, but it, it made you a better person. Um, you know, bearing the costs um, of all of that. And then, <laughs> when I talk about costs, you got to copyright your art. And and that is something I get asked about a lot. Yeah, I'm um, curious about You know, that. How, how did you go about doing that? Um, and of course, the bigger you get, the more exposed you are. And so the more your artwork becomes available to plagiarism, and of course that happens. So Charlie, the same Charlie Foreman I was talking about, who is a lawyer here in Lauderdale, he set all that up where um, all the work was copyrighted. His wife actually looked after it mostly. Um, And, you know, I'm getting these big bills coming in, and he said, Guy, don't worry about it. It'll be the best money you mm-hmm. ever spent. Wow. <laughs> that's I, what great advice. Because yeah. you do, especially if you're an artist that's, and, and especially if you're, you know, you're you're making a limited amount of money, you're going, oh, I got to spend this in the right spot. I can't just spend on anything. Yep. Um, so so we had a raft of, of um, different people coming along, ripping us off, um, and it wasn't just in America, it was in other countries too. So once the T-shirts got out, you know, you find Mexico, they're printing them like hell, Costa Rica. And they were exact replicas, but without my signature. Oh, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and it was like, so we just went in there with, with lawyers. They, they met Mexicans or they met Costa Rican lawyers or whatever and sorted it out, you know, and, and stopped it. And nowadays, it's not an issue. Yeah. And it, occasionally you see somebody... You know who, who's done something, but it's not like they turned it into a big business off of your yeah. hard work. Um, and then they get a lot of tattoos. Oh, oh yeah! Wow. Have you have you seen a lot of that? A lot. Really? <laughs> it's like, incredible. It's, it's it's kind of a compliment, I suppose. But Does anybody have your name tattooed? Uh, some of them do. Yeah. Wow! <laughs> or they'll awesome. take their favorite yeah. painting or something and yeah. take it to the tattoo artist. Yeah. Yep. Wow, that Which, is interesting. I mean, you see people do that all yeah. the time to get a tattoo. They take a yeah. likeness of something. Yeah, choose, sure. So that, that all they would do in this case, pick their favorite guy, Harvey. Pick. Yeah, and we've we've never really been bothered about about it because you know what they're going to do. Um, yeah, take cut off your skin and sell it. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, okay, so I uh, had we recently got your book, Underwater World. Yes, my it, that was my real pandemic project. Apart, apart from the. Um, the Facebook lives there. It's absolutely beautiful. And so we looked through, obviously for us, we were really intrigued by stories that you had with Kent in particular. And so a couple of them talk about how you took Kent um, and he caught his first marlin with you or swordfish. I'm sorry. uh, Swordfish in Venezuela. Yeah. Marlin in Panama. Yeah. He, we did whale watching in the, um, 
the DR, Dominican Republic. Um, we've been to Australia, the Great Barrier Reef. We've been to Hawaii. Where have we been? In Mexico. We've been to about seven or eight different locations together. And yeah. It is. It's there was uh, one story in particular mm. that I'll read just a little piece of it because I'd sure. love for you maybe to elaborate more, and then we can jump into maybe talking specifically about, in this case, it was about whales. Right. So um, in in the section on humpback whales of the Silver Bank, mm-hmm. um, you describe how snorkelers can legally swim with humpback whales um, on this Silver Bank, right? And so there's one part that, one, you're really... Um, really descriptive and great writer because I can imagine when I read yeah. these. Yeah, she was reading them out loud to me. Yeah, too, it, yeah was it, it was it was so great. But I'll, I want to read this one in particular, and then maybe it'll jog some memories for you on this. But Kent and I were able to start creating some art, having had some inspirational encounters. He had brought some modeling clay, and I had brought a large canvas to do some painting. It was wonderful being able to sit up on the deck and paint between dives after lunch or in the evening and watch the sun go down while in the near distance whales were slapping fins and tails and presenting the occasional full-body breach. The breeze whipped the spray away in a billion golden droplets and the loud report reached us a second later. And so later in the in the story, you talk about how... Um, You guys were, it says, Alex was in the boat while Kent, Jessica, Rick, and I were all swimming and filming. And when I looked down, all I saw was the snout and jaw plate loaded with sharp barnacles of the male escort coming up at us fast. The barnacles were bright white and getting bigger rapidly. Abort was all I could think as I furiously backpedaled. The snout, head, and pectorals of the male reared up above us and crashed back down on the surface. We reckoned that was a clear warning by the escort that we were close enough. No harm done, but it does raise the question of what would happen if you were bumped by an adult whale or if one breaching actually landed on the chase boat. So that is a... That's pretty wild. Such an pretty, amazing... Pretty sketchy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So what a, what an opportunity to be able to take your art, to take your paint, paints with you and for Kent to bring his clay and you guys to be able to create while you're out there. And it's something I learned to do during our, our fishing TV series, Portraits from the Deep, which is the, the title of the other book, the precursor to that one. Um, because at the end of each show, we'd have a little paint, painting section. Very often in that era, the, the and st- to a certain extent nowadays, in these fishing shows, they have something at the end where they're cooking up what they, whatever they call the hogfish or a snapper or yeah. a tuna or whatever. And I thought, well, why not have a painting session? Nobody's yeah. going to do that. Yeah. So that kind of evolved from this. And so um, I do it in a few places nowadays, a lot at Tropic Star, um, more than anywhere else because you spend more time there. But yeah, that, that was an amazing time. I went three different times to the Silver Bank. Mm-hmm. It's about a 90-mile uh, trip from the northern side, Puerto Plata you fly into, go on a liverboard dive boat, and I remember it distinctly flying into Puerto Plata because they had the nastiest, most aggressive customs officers I oh. have never met. <laughs> and when you're carrying camera gear and all this oh, stuff, yeah. you, as you know, you're like a target. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In those days, the porters would just come over and, you know, lick their lips because they, they know they're going to get a big tip. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> you survived. <laughs> but the story with, with the whales was because the, the mums come in to have their calves in amongst the coral bomb is, is, is shallow, clear water, uh, not very warm because it's winter, still March. Um, so you wear a suit, but it's all snorkeling. And you can get access to the the whales close because they're not really moving around the mumps. They're sitting close off the bottom. Say this is the bottom here, mm-hmm. maybe 10, 15 feet off in 40 feet of water. And they, they come up to breathe every 15 to 18 minutes. The calf now will sit underneath the mum mm-hmm. down here, and you can see the head sticking out. It's kind of cute. But they they can't hold their breath that long, so they come up every four minutes on their own. And you're, and there, just you're all there, all, all, all of you there with your little chase boat, mm-hmm. not right over them, but off to one side in a line. So you all have, think, you have the the animal in sight. And if if the calf came, came over to interact with you, that was fine, but you you were asked not to go and swim to them. But they're very inquisitive, and they will come over and, and play with you. 
At one time, one of them, Swipe Kent, and oh, I think I gosh. mentioned it in his thigh with his tail, and he goes, you know, he's hobbling around on the deck after, and said, <laughs> bloody hell, <laughs> whoever said whales were soft and floppy, they're bloody liars. <laughs> <laughs> That Thanks, sounds yeah, like Kent. Good impression. Just like Kent. And it was he had a you know a hematoma, a bruise there for a couple of days. But um, when the mums would come up, if they were cool, they would just take a breath, maybe move a few yards and go back down. But if they got agitated, they would move. But if the escort was there, oh. the male who's looking That's, for yeah. looking for you know the unemployed, yeah, <laughs> he's looking for a job. Wow. Then he would get in the way and blow you off every time. And that's what happened that time, Denise. And it was it was kind of, kind of scary, actually. Yeah, I can you know, imagine. You, you know, the, the barnacles, especially, apart from the impact of such a large animal, uh, or, you know, a, a fin slap, if your head was above the surface, it would crush your skull. Oh, my gosh. But the, um, there have been instances of humpbacks crashing into boats, not there, but in other places, uh, because they become so numerous. They are one of the few whale species who's really, whose population has really rebounded strongly since the, the cessation of whaling okay. in, in 1986. And we see them everywhere now, um, and it's good to see. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, this, was, this is something that's just dawned on me right now uh, uh, to ask. But the the recent thing with orcas and not, what what's this what's going on there? Yeah, everybody's asking about yeah. that. And again, they are the smartest of all creatures. And so, you know, who knows what they're doing? Are they playing? Are they pissed off? Are they just being malevolent? You know, what's going on? Okay. It's, it's limited just to just a few. Uh -huh. So I wouldn't read too much into it other okay. than other than, um, you know, they're fooling around. It might be at our expense. 